All right, so welcome to chapter seven. Um, it's interesting because of how the title of chapter seven is. Uh, technically, we, we used to focus solely on cash, but as you see here, um, they start with fraud and internal control, which is actually the more important topic to talk about. So much of what we're gonna be covering here is about fraud and internal control. It's in the cash chapter because cash is the most vulnerable asset to you know, employees instead of putting it in the register, putting it in their pocket. Um, and although that, does, although that does happen with other assets like inventory or supplies, um, it's very, you know, it's the common problem is cash is the most vulnerable asset to get stolen. So that's why they've introduced fraud and internal control here. And this is what we're gonna focus on here because this is something that's critically important. Right. So chapter seven really is a, a focus on learning objective one um, because it's important for all business students to understand this issue. So fraud, um, this is, of course, fraud is any type of, you know, deceitful, dishonest, misrepresentation, act, et cetera. Um, it's a broad definition, but for the focus of our talk here, we're going to limit the definition to a dishonest act by an employee that results in personal gain for that employee, but a loss for the employer. Okay. What sets this up is really three factors that sort of, sort of set this stuff up. First is employees have <clears throat> the opportunity to handle cash. And I don't know about many of you, but I've had jobs in the past uh, where cash handling is part of the job. Now you could do that as a cashier. You could do that as a waiter, waitress, busboy, et cetera. Um, but handling cash is within and of itself presents an opportunity. Uh, if you're a bank teller, do you take anybody with cash. Does anyone here have a job or had a job where you handled cash on a regular basis? <laughs> I had. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Yeah. Uh, was it retail? I work as a cashier. Oh, okay. Great. Um, so there's a lot of employees that actually have the opportunity to handle cash. So that's where it starts. Now, not just because you have the opportunity to handle cash doesn't mean you're going to be pocket again, right? Because that, that's not how most people are. But what happens with some people is this other factor comes in. They're suffering from financial pressures, okay? It's very difficult. You know, it's a, we live in a part of the country where it's, it's hard to make ends meet. There's a high cost of living. And so rents are expensive. Other types of things are pretty expensive uh, to live here. So if you're working at a job where you're barely making ends meet, there's financial pressure. Anything unexpected that happens, that's more financial pressure. And so this idea that a lot of people have financial pressures is just the beginning. Throw on top of that, people have their little habits. Some call them addictions. They might like to gamble. They might like drugs or alcohol on an extreme basis. They might like um, to do other types of, they might have other types, shopping addictions, for example, they just can't stop spending money. So they, they add this added financial pressures to that person's life or to an employee's life in addition to just trying to make ends meet. So here you have two of the cornerstones. There's the opportunity because you're handling cash and then there are some folks that have significant financial pressures for whatever reason. The last thing that comes into play, which makes fraud happen, is this idea we call rationalization. And I, I like to explain rationalization as basically convincing yourself 
that it's okay to take something that's not yours. And, you know, you're convincing yourself that, <laughs> that uh, doing a bad thing is a good thing, in essence. And so <clears throat> rationalization comes in a lot of different ways. A lot of times it's anger on the job. Uh, and so, you know, you're working your butt off and you don't get that promotion. Uh, and they give it to someone who perhaps doesn't deserve it, but it might be a favorite of a, of a manager. And you're like, well, I really, it's really, I deserve all this. You know, it's really, this money should have gone, gone to me in the first place. And so sometimes anger gets in the way of that and, and causes rationalization to happen. Sometimes it's just the idea of, I deserve it. Well, this company is a billion dollar company or a multi-billion dollar company. They're not gonna miss this 10 bucks, this 20 bucks, this 100 bucks. Um, and so that's also rationalization because it doesn't matter how big the company is or how wealthy the company is, the money's not yours to take, right? So that's what rationalization does, convinces us it's, it's okay to do something that's not okay. And so when you put all of these together, um, they create what they consider, you know, this perfect factors for fraudulent activity to happen. Okay. And again, we're looking at this from a definition of the cost to the employer, right? Fraud is not just this, there's lots of aspects of fraud but we're looking at it simply as an employer being somewhat a victim of a dishonest act by an employee. Okay, so step in Congress. Congress comes in and they have had a, a number of different you know, actions uh, to regulate and make sure the financial systems of the country are working. One of the things they did was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act back in 2001, 2002, that area. It applies to all US corporations that are publicly traded. And so if they have stock on the stock exchange, they're a public company, these rules apply to them, these laws apply to them. What uh, Sarbanes-Oxley did was a number of different things, but one of the more important things it did is required corporations to maintain, maintain a system or create a system, if they didn't have one, of internal control, right? To do everything, to put policies in place that would prevent fraud from happening or greatly reduce the risk that fraud would happen. So this is what this part of the chapter really kind of talks about. But Sarbanes actually was quite expansive in other ways too. One of the things it did for the very, very first time is corporate executives like the president and CEO and the board of directors must sign off on financial statements. They also must ensure that control activities are in place, they are reliable, and there's ways to show that they're effective. Okay. So this really kind of has to go down with the internal control system, uh, part, which is what we're focusing on. Um, it required that the auditors of their financial statements must be independent outside auditors. They don't have a business relationship with that corporation outside of the fact they're auditing the books. And an audit is basically sort of a double checking, right? Since all of these companies are playing by the same rules, which is GAAP, right? That means any CPA firm can come in because they're specialists in GAAP and check the books of a company to see if they're following the rules, right? And so that's one thing they had to do. But in addition to actually checking all the financial statements and making sure that those financial statements are set up according to GAAP, they must also say, look, we've also checked this corporation has put in place an internal control system that reduces 
fraud. That reduces fraud or the likelihood of fraudulent activity. In other words, they have to do their best to um, safeguard their assets in this case. We don't want anyone taking the cash. We don't want anyone taking supplies. We don't want anyone taking inventory. We don't want to take anything, anything at all. So are there internal control systems that are in place to discourage that and, and limit that? Uh, another thing the law did was create a public company accounting oversight board, uh, which is basically the part of the law. Anytime there's a law by Congress, there's got to be an administration to um, set up to, to do it, to make sure the law is carried out. So every time there's a law passed, in essence, there's a little bit more bureaucracy created. And so this is the oversight board that makes sure that Sarbanes-Oxley laws are being followed. So let's talk about internal control. This is about companies. Again, these are public corporations. They need to put in place certain things that protect their assets. Okay, protect it from what? Protect it from fraudulent activity that they might get taken. Um, and so that's the number one reason these things are in place. All the assets of a company belong to the company. They don't belong to anybody else. And so no one else has a right to take it. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that, that is helpful in having internal controls is actually it, it creates a lot more reliability and accuracy in the accounting record. And so if the accounting record shows X amount of dollars of inventory, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more accurate now that these in, uh, controls are in place. Um, when you put controls in, you're making sure that you're operating efficiently. And so actually the weird thing about this law is it should increase how efficient companies work because now they have to sit and think about it and design those controls. Okay. And of course, uh, companies have to make sure that they're in compliance with the law. And so there, there are additional things that they have to do to make sure they're following everything. But again, the most important part of internal control is safeguarding their assets, right? Because cash, supplies, inventory are subject to fraudulent activity. They're subject to be taken. So they look at um, some components and they have identified five primary components of internal control. Um, the environment, <clears throat> um, what's the risk? What activities are in place to reduce that risk? Uh, how is everything being communicated to employees of how things are supposed to go and how things are supposed to work? And is the business monitoring how all those things are going? So basically there's sort of a, uh, uh, a list here. Now there are uh, very specific principles that you might relate to. If you've ever worked in, particularly in a retail environment, for example, you've probably, or a business operation, you've probably seen these controls in place. And if you have, if you have any insight, really feel free to chime in anytime. Be happy to hear your story. One is establish direct responsibility. Okay. So control is most effective when you know that there's one person responsible for a task. So what you see in some companies, and it, it's right down here in the, uh, in the graphic, is give every cashier their own uh, register and their own cash box. That way, if there's anything missing from the cash drawer, they were the only, they're the only ones who were in control of it. And so thus the company knows that, well, we have to make sure this person didn't take it or make any huge mistakes or errors. Um, you know, in, in explaining why the cash drawer does not 
balance at the end of their shift, okay? Uh, it's a bit more difficult, it's a lot more difficult in fact, when they're sharing cash registers, which you will have if you walk into even your local steward's shop, there'll be one uh, or two cash registers that are active and there might be, you know, a, a group of four or five employees that are using all of them. Um, sometimes, uh, and so it makes it a little bit more hard to, to determine exactly who is responsible because now you're, you're looking at everybody. Um, sometimes you actually can share a drawer or a cash register, um, but you're requiring the employee to put in a code, sort of a passcode to indicate that they're the ones who are using it at that time. And as soon as that transaction is done, they can close out or sign out. And so that also is a very effective way to see who's responsible for the handling of this of the cash in this case here. Okay. Um, so part of that responsibility is you want to limit access to certain personnel. Um, so you can identify if there's any issues. Another thing that they need to do is start segregating the duties. Okay, so one individual is not doing everything <clears throat> and thus how can you monitor that? How do you know that all that stuff is going uh, smoothly without fraud possibly occurring? Okay, so whatever the activity is, assuming they're all related, there should be different people involved in that particular activity. And so no one person has the power or control to create the fraud in the first place, okay? So they give you an example of the record keeping, okay? So you have um, uh, a, a register where you're electronically keeping track of of the revenue that's generated and the amount of cash that's being collected. So that's your that's a record that's being kept. And that should be separate from physical custody of say the cash. Same thing in inventory, there might be a, a place that can verify someone who's receiving the inventory and can verify that this amount of inventory is part of that record and this is what we received. And someone else is physically uh, uh, storing or moving or stocking that particular inventory. And so keeping those things separate, that's the segregation part, really sort of helps the accountability to safeguard the asset. And so your illustration shows employee A, who actually maintains the books about what's going on with cash, and employee B is actually the person who actually has the cash on hand, the physical asset is right there. Those folks should have matching records. They should have matching records. Right? You might've been in a situation where no matter to get anything done, there's a document. So documentation is extremely important for internal control because oftentimes those documents have places in which need to be signed off or go from one department to another department to another department or one person to another person to another person. And uh, this is important because those are control activities. We can find out who is involved um, in taking care of a particular asset. And if something is off, well, then you know who to go to. So again, um, use companies are gonna be using a lot of pre number documents. Uh, those documents are meant to be a, a control to make sure that all the assets are accounted for, okay? Um, employees, if they are moving inventory or moving, you know, are balancing their drawer at the end of the, of the day, um, these, these documents become source documents for the next department to check, okay? And so part of it might be signed off by you and your manager, and that might go up to accounting uh, or to a finance manager to, to verify. And so those are very, very important to have a documentation process. So you can follow 
the trail of what happened to those assets. And you've all been in places where there's a number of physical controls that are already there to help reduce the, the possibility of fraud, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that I, I mentioned, you know, the, the idea of a pass key or, or something like that. Well, again, for, uh, for sharing a register, having everyone having their own code that they have to use to log in before they can use the cash register gives that type of accountability. But also access to certain things. So who has access to the cash? Who has access to inventory and supplies? Well, oftentimes you might need a passcode, a certain, you know, you might have a fingerprint or an eyeball scan, which is not fun, I'm, I'm sure, um, to be able to go in uh, and have access to those types of things. So it actually controls all of that. Right? Um, you might certainly have warehouses that are locked, storage cabinets that are locked, and only certain members of the staff have a key to get in to certain types of things. Um, certainly you have in, in cases of banks and other, uh, or actually even, I, I know a lot of restaurants and others have, have safes in the back, uh, but there's safes, vaults, uh, other types of boxes for important papers uh, and cash to be stored. Uh, not everyone should know the combination to that, right, to get in. And so there's only a few people who then are the ones who are part of that control process. Um, in terms of employees, right? I mean, that's what they used to have time clocks for is so make sure that employees are not stealing time. Because if you say you worked uh, eight hours that day instead of seven hours, which you actually worked, you're stealing an hour's worth of pay from the company. That's part of this fraud definition here, okay? So uh, some companies still do it by that, whereas, you know, they'll, they'll have a little paper-based system of you work from nine to five, and so you're going to get paid for eight hours today, regardless. Um, other times you have to swipe in. You might have an identification card uh, that you might have to swipe in uh, to time in. You might put a code in or something like that. Uh, all of those are meant to help to control the possibility that people might be stealing wages from, from the employer. Uh, you certainly have uh, inventory is, as we've known from looking at chapter five and six, the, the critical reason why retailers and merchandisers exist is to sell their inventory. So safeguarding that inventory clearly is as important as safeguarding the cash. And so they'll have television monitors, secret shoppers, garment sensors and tags, uh, all different types of things to help defer theft. Uh, and I know a lot of people are thinking about this theft here is shoplifting from customers. Well, certainly that's part of it, but uh, the worst part of it is employees actually know the system better than customers do. So although shoplifting does occur uh, by customers, it's actually um, sadly one of those types of things where employees steal from their own companies more. And that's, that's a big issue. Uh, and then of course the actual buildings and other areas like warehouses have alarms to, uh, to prevent break-ins and, and stealage. All of these types of things are internal control activities called physical activity, physical control, sorry. Uh, independent uh, internal vest, uh, verification means that there's a third party um, that looks, you know, who's really independent of the process, but knows what is going on. And so we talked earlier about employee A and employee B. So they're back here. Employee A obviously is keeping track of the cash uh, through uh, through the books, you know. Whereas the employee B here is actually has the cash uh, physically there. Uh, well, that might mean that a, uh, an independent person, someone who knows about how this all works, like uh, the assistant treasurer, is verifying that these records are are good. And if there's anything that's wrong with the record, that's called a discrepancy. 
and those discrepancies are reported to management and that's looked into because possible fraud could happen. And believe it or not, human resources are in um, involved in uh, internal control activities. Um, one of the first things that you might need to do in filling out an application is testify on that application that you don't have, uh, you haven't been convicted of a felony. Um, in essence, you don't have a, a background of uh, taking stuff, <laughs> you know, theft um, from, from your other employers or from other people, because that makes you a higher risk uh, person to hire. And one of the things that they have to do once they hire you is what they call bond you. Uh, okay, so we're not talking any 50 shades here. We're talking about insurance. Um, here in this case, when you bond an employee who handles cash, you're basically taking out insurance to protect yourself in case there's fraud by that employee. But in order to get the insurance, you have to have employees that don't have those backgrounds, okay? Doesn't mean it's not gonna happen in the future. Obviously people um, might have varying changes in their life and circumstances that lead to a fraud being committed. But, uh, but they have to have a pretty clean record before they get bonded or insured against this risk. Another thing you can do to make sure employees are not, um, uh, not in a position to sort of take stuff or commit that type of fraudulent activity is rotate their duties. So, you know, they're, um, you always have someone new coming in doing those types of duties who know the business because they've been working there. So they're sort of rotating around and they know if something's off and they're gonna be reporting to their boss, oh, well, I can't find this to get this done. Well, what happened to it, All right? So that sets up chances for businesses to investigate if something is wrong. When an employee, a new employee is rotated into another employee's job and they find that they can't get that job done because some certain things are missing. So that opens up uh, investigations for that. One of the weird things is uh, employers want you to take a vacation, not because they care about you, because they really don't, um, but because when you're when you're away, does anything change? Um, I worked in uh, investments. I was on a on, on a desk uh, where mutual fund investments were coming through my desk at around uh, seven hundred to eight hundred. A million dollars a day would be traded and because uh, it was a three and a half billion dollar fund and so clearly I needed to be audited on a regular basis uh, as a trader on that desk and I also went through periods of time where they said you have to take a week off or two weeks off for vacation and the reason is, is that if thing they want to see if there's any changes to what's happening at your desk. Everything should work the same when you're not there as when you're there. If things are different, um, there's potential fraud going on and they will investigate. So that's true. I mean, if you have someone on vacation and all of a sudden there's, you've discovered after a week or two that there's simply you know, more inventory, uh, more supplies, more inventory is there than usual, more supplies are on hand than usual, uh, more money is there than usual uh, versus when they're not there. Um, maybe something's going on. Maybe something's we're certainly worth looking into. So, um, so this is that. And then of course, certainly conducting a background check uh, is very, very important. So, uh, certainly the, one of the most important things that they're going to be doing is pulling a criminal offender record, which is called a quarry. And this basically is a, uh, a document of, um, of everything about your, your past involving any criminal activity. 
Uh, sadly, it does include uh, arrests, uh, but what they are looking at is conviction. Okay, it's not that, because you can get charged with anything, basically. It's, uh, did they, can you prove it right, in, a court of, in a court of law? Because that's basically the only thing that matters is if there's evidence through the court that something terrible happened, then you could be damn sure something terrible happened. Um, and so, you know, that's our system. That's how it works. You need proof. And so that proof is part of that conviction record. And that's going to be on a quarry. And that is basically used to signal how risky you are. So uh, let me give you an example how these are supposed to be used and how they're not supposed to be used. Um, so you apply for a job driving a truck um, in the shipping department of a large company and the merchandise is quite uh, expensive merchandise. Uh, you, they pull a quarry as part of your background check and they see you've been convicted of, uh, of larceny or of petty theft or something along this line. Well, that means there's a, you're risky because you've taken other stuff. Not only did you take other stuff that didn't belong to you, you were found guilty of it in court. So it was clearly documented in court. Uh, it's not just a rumor. Um, and so that means that if you've taken other things, then they're not going to be trusting you with their, uh, their inventory. I mean, it's just, they have a right to do that. Uh, and so businesses need to know that. However, how this is not supposed to be used is let's say you have a, a drug offense on that. So you have marijuana offense because, you know, prior to this current streak of liberalization and mar marijuana laws at the state level, it's still a federal crime to have marijuana. And so let's say that's on your record. You were found with a little bit of marijuana, but charged and found guilty. Uh, well, that has nothing to do with taking care of your inventory. It has nothing to do with handling cash, uh, unless you have a history of smoking it. Um, but nonetheless, it shouldn't be used against you in a, in, in a job. And so these background checks are, are supposed to be specific to the job and if there's risks uh, to the employer in providing you with that. Okay, so uh, again, Internal control principles include establishing responsibility, documenting, having someone internally uh, being a, an independent verification. It does not include the management. This is do not include. It does not include the management responsibility there. So we're going to take a look at a few frauds, uh, not to make this into a, uh, you know, on like investigation TV, but there's several here. So here's a fraud involving a training supervisor at a healthcare company called Colossal Healthcare. Uh, and as part of their training process for, for claims processing training program, they would create a fictitious claim that would be used by the tradies. These fictitious claims were sent to the accounts payable department for payment. And then after the training class had been done, Maureen would notify the AP department that these were the fictitious claims and thus don't pay them. However, Ms. Maureen did not inform the accounts payable on every claim. Uh, she created fictitious claims for entities that she controlled. In other words, she would get the payments. And then she would let the uh, payables department pay that entity and deposit it into that account, which she owned. So this was a colossal mistake. Uh, she took $11 million over time of doing this. And uh, what was a missing control was technically the healthcare company did not really set out a good policy of establishing responsibility. Okay. They needed to restrict the ability for her, 
while she's training people to approve those claims for payables. Okay. She would have, she should not have been authorized to create a claim in a live system because then they would be paid. Those claims should have been flagged with faults or dummy numbers. Um, so the accounts payable department could see it's a dummy uh, training and it should not be paid. Or in essence, they should create a, another system, a training system that's not connected to the accounting system. Uh, so she can train without actually getting paid. So that was a missing responsibility there. Here's another one. Larry Fairbanks. Uh, he's the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Communication at ASOP University. And he was allowed under ASOP's policies to sign off on purchases of under $2,500 without any additional approval. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, he liked antiques and collectibles. And so he sometimes bought some stuff for himself. Uh, how did that happen? Well, he simply replaced the invoices with fake vendor invoices that looked like the invoices used in his department. And he basically submitted those fake invoices to the accounting department and they got paid. Uh, Larry took almost a half a million dollars from ASOP. Now that is a lesson. Missing control, those duties should have been segregated. Larry should not have had the ability to sign off even on this amount of money. Okay, very, very important. So part of it is, is when you're, when the college is purchasing something, they need to make sure that the purchasing activities are segregated so they can be verified by different people in the process. So this guy, Larry, he was ordering the item, which is fine in and of itself. There are people that have the authority to order items, but someone different receives it. He was receiving the item. That's a problem. And then in a lot of companies, someone else, someone different should receive the bill for those items. But he was receiving them. So basically, he, can, he had control all over the, in, the important documents, the ordering of the item, receiving of the item, and the invoice. He had control of all those documents. And so those, those needed to be segregated. So this fraud would not have taken place. That's a lot of tuition sucked up by this guy, okay. That's, yeah. students pay the tuition at universities. That's what he took, okay. So here's another person, Angela, who works as an accounts payable clerk for a construction company. I'm sure it's a reputable firm. And she prepares and issues checks. She also reconciles their bank accounts. Okay, so this is how her fraud went. She wrote checks for the company, the, uh, for costs that the company did not, did not actually incur, such as fake taxes. Okay, of course, I guess it's, it's all fake in some people's heads. So a supervisor then approved and signed those checks. But before issuing the check, Angela got busy with some whiteout. And she would white out the payee line and change it to her personal account. Now, normally speaking, this wouldn't, this wouldn't get very far in a company. The reason it got so far for so long is because it was Angela who reconciled that bank account. So the only place the check is gonna show up as paid is in the bank account. So if she's getting the statements from the bank and she's checking off, everything's okay, she's getting away with the fraud. No one else ever saw that. So no one else could ever pick it up. How much did Angela take? 
over a half a million dollars. Okay. You can construct a lot for a half a million bucks. What was the mission con missing control? Again, it's segregation of duties, right? So again, she, she was the record keeper and she physically had control of that cash. So she wrote the checks, she balanced, she did the bank reconciliation, which is the only, only place the check shows up is in this statement. So no one else knew about it and she was able to get away with it. Here is a fraud regarding uh, employees that travel and want to get their travel costs reimbursed. So in this case, these are employees at a fashion company that travel around because all companies other than lately, right? We're living in a COVID year. Uh, all companies usually have a lot of business travel. And so when you travel, what does it, you know, you have your hotel, you got your meals, you got other types of things. So the company would require, would require anyone to uh, submit receipts on what they paid. Uh, the receipts could include a detailed bill for the meal or the credit card or a copy of the employee's monthly credit card bill. Okay, so the credit card receipt or the bill. So those are a bunch of ors. Those are a bunch of ors. In this case, there were uh, a number of designers who frequently traveled together and knew what the system was like. And so a few of them got together and decided to say, look, why don't we get reimbursed for this expense? All of us, all three of us. So this is what collusion is right, in essence. And so if they had a meal together that costs 200 bucks, one person of that would submit the bill for the, for the meal as proof of payment and collect that. Another person submitted the credit card receipt for the $200 and would get reimbursed for that. And the third person would get that monthly credit card bill and get reimbursed. So instead of re being re reimbursed $200 for the meal, the company gave out $600 for that meal because all three of them got 200. So it might not seem like a lot of money, but 75,000 will get you places, okay? So in this case, the documentation procedures were off, okay? So you need to just really require one thing, you know? And, uh, and that's really important. So the original detailed receipt should really be the, uh, the standard for setting that up. Um, another way to do it is to issue a corporate credit card um, to those frequent travelers and say so you use the corporate card. So it's, you know, it's not your card. You have authority to use it but the company's gonna know everything about how you use that card. So you'll, you'll be able to be held accountable if there's any fraud, okay? Um, so again, there's, there's a bunch of frauds here um, that, you wanna, that you wanna take a look at. Um, and and that's, that's very, very important to understand all this stuff, okay? So there are some limitations to these internal control measures. Uh, they cost money, they cost money and to set up. And so um, the cost shouldn't exceed the benefit. There's always a human element involved. And so um, people are people and we are flawed individuals. And so we sometimes will still cheat. Sometimes we'll still uh, overlook things. Um, sometimes we'll still not be able to fully comprehend how we stop certain activities from happening. So there's a human element that's involved that just is always there. 
Uh, and of course, the size of the business. Some businesses are very small uh, compared to others. And so um, you trust more people to do more things in a smaller business. In a smaller business, it's almost, it's very hard to segregate duties at times. Um, and so how do you set up an internal control system if you can't segregate the duties? Because you do rely on this one person to do everything. <laughs> right. So, um, so that's, there's some certain limitations involved, obviously. Okay. And so here uh, for the do it exercise uh, for this part of the chapter, it's really sort of understanding uh, which con control activity um, is being violated. So all of your homework is going to look like this for this chapter. Okay. Uh, there's no technically no accounting per se, as you see, it's situational. And so when a person is primarily responsible for reconciling the bank account and they make all the bank deposits, that's a problem because they could take some of those deposits for them. It won't show up and no one else will know. So segregating of duties is what would be violated that's the best control for to stop that from happening. This company here, their treasurer received an award for distinguished service because he had not taken a vacation in 30 years. Well, that's because if he did take a vacation, they would find out uh, what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so forcing those vacations to make sure no problems are happening in a particular area is a human resource control. Okay. Um, in this case here, in order to save money uh, on order slips and reduce time, a local bar does not buy any pre-numbered slips. Well, I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff going on at your local bar uh, outside of drinking. And so, you know, because it's a, a lot, sometimes it's a big cash business and, um, and, and cash sometimes is not always well protected as we know. And so those documentation procedures would help control any problems um, or limit the uh, possibility that uh, stuff would happen. All right, we're back to the main screen because literally we're done with chapter seven. Any questions? 